Um, do you guys have the clicker back there? Do you have the clicker back there somewhere? Cool. Can you, no, please don't do that. <laughs> Hey, good morning, church. Uh, I'm glad to be with you this morning and glad to be taking a look at this text. Um, if you have been in church for any amount of time, I suspect you have heard some version of this story. Um, I remember reading it or having it read to me as a child in Sunday school. I don't know that we necessarily had flannel graphs, but like definitely got that vibe. Um, but we're putting this um, kind of a storybook picture of a story, and I want to like peel it off the flannel graph and put some flesh and some bone to it. I want us to consider that this is history that is written down for us. It's a historical account of something that actually happened to real people, and I hope um, that our time here together will... Um, will show some of that. And we're doing that in the context of this series that we've called Faith Under Fire. There are a number of reasons that we could point to as why, um, but I suspect that maybe some of us feel like everybody uh, is against us, that there, anytime we want to take a stand for something spiritual or we want to uh, live our lives in honor to Jesus, that we um, meet opposition, that uh, on every side, we are pressed and we are uh, opposed. Um, and I just want to say, like, as we are reflecting on this and as we're observing this and as we're looking at a story about how God acted in history to address some of these things, um, that we should not be surprised. Like, Jesus was really clear, hey, if you follow me, the people who hated me also will hate you. Um, in this world, you will have trouble, but I give you my peace. And so as, as followers of Jesus, um, it's something that we should just be expected. We shouldn't, shouldn't be taken off guard by. Um, yeah, so that's coming out of John's te- or Jesus' teaching recorded by John in, in John chapter 15. Um, but as we begin this morning, like I just ask uh, if you would pause together with me and uh, pray. It's our habit to pray together to disciples' prayer, and this prayer is not a mantra, it's not a magic spell, um, but it is the model of prayer that Jesus left for us, and the attitudes that he gives us um, will help us to follow him well as our hearts are shaped by it. And so if we're going to pray it together, it's easiest if we use the same words, that's why I put the words on the screen, Um, but I just ask you to bow your hearts and to pray together with me as we begin this morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you'd open with me to Daniel chapter 3, the book of Daniel chapter 3. If you're using these blue Bibles uh, that are tucked under the chairs in front of you here in the room is on page 928, Daniel chapter 3. And as we've been looking at this story, uh, we've seen a really fascinating picture of a time in history where um, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people that he had called out of slavery and delivered and given them their own land, um, had continued to reject him. And as they continued to reject him, God continued to send prophets and warn them, hey, if you continue to reject me, the day will come where I'm going to reject you. I'm going to turn my back and I'm going to let you be carried off into slavery. And Daniel opens up right at the time where that happens, where God lets his people be overthrown. There's an invading army. And this army from Babylon comes through and they take the children of the wealthy aristocrats in Israel and take them back to Babylon, to the capital city, and begin to re-educate them. And that's where we met Daniel. 
and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they began to re-educate them. They even gave them new names because their names from Hebrew reject, or reflected and honored God's glory. And so as the Babylonians brought them in, they said, yeah, we can't continue to give glory to your God, Yahweh. We have to give glory to the gods of Babylon. And so they give them all new names. Um, and we've seen how God has continued to preserve them and to work with them, um, even in the testing of what they ate and on to um, crazy, crazy requests from the king, impossible requests from the king, to make known to him not only the interpretation of his dream, but also the content of his dream. So chapter 3 opens, uh, zeroed in on that king, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Uh, I think I read that twice, if you'll excuse me. Uh, they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed, out, proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, we open with King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you remember, uh, if, if you were here with us, if you weren't with us, then you can catch up on the podcast or on our website or YouTube page. Last week, we looked at the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had that he said to his, his guys, he said, look, I need you to tell me what my dream meant. And they said, okay, well, what was the dream? And he says, no, 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 I need you to tell me the dream too. I need to know that you know what you're talking about. And so there was only one guy in all of Babylon who was able to do that. And that guy gave God all the credit. You remember Daniel got the vision, he got the dream, and he comes and stands before the king to give the king the interpretation. And the king says, can you tell me my dream? And what it means, and Daniel says, nah, can't, nobody can, it's impossible. <laughs> Daniel, like you came all this way, your, your neck is literally on the line, what do you mean no? He says, no, nobody can, but there is a God who re reveals mysteries, and he has shown you what's going to happen in the future, and he has told me what he told you so that you can understand what's going on in your head. So, Nebuchadnezzar then, here's his dream, and his dream, there's a giant statue, a giant image, and the top part of it is gold, and the other parts are not so refined, different metals, and uh, Daniel gives the interpretation of the dream, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the golden head, and so Nebuchadnezzar says, great, I'm the golden head, I need to build a giant statue of myself to give honor to myself. And so he builds this giant statue, all of gold, and calls everybody, everybody, everybody who's important and says, look, you guys need to come and worship me because I'm golden head. My empire is the best. There's no one who's going to be better than me. Everybody who comes after me is not going to be as glorious as me. They might be stronger, but they're not going to be as glorious. So why don't you come and tell me how great I am, please. Whenever you hear the music, whenever the beat drops, I need you to start to worship this golden image. And just like that, Nebuchadnezzar, or I don't know, I kind of like to call him Old Neb, Old Neb completely skips over Yahweh. You, you, you see what he did, right? He had this dream, and he was perplexed by it. And so he called all of his people together and says, you guys got to tell me what this dream is. And they're like, yeah, this is impossible. 
And Daniel shows up and says, yes, it is impossible, but God can show you and he can tell you what it means. And Neb hears the word from the Lord takes what he wants out of it, gleans what he wants out of it, hears the things that tickle his ear, and builds a statue to himself instead of giving glory and honor to the one who revealed the mystery. It's like a, sc- a stone skipping over the ocean that thinks it can fly. Right? Somebody else threw the rock. The water gave it something to bounce off of, but the rock thinks it can fly now. Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, I'm the golden head in the dream. That means I need a golden image that everybody else is going to worship. He's forgetting that God alone holds our future in his hands. He'll come shortly to learn that lesson. But I wonder, when are we quick to skip over God's involvement in our lives? When have we been face-to-face with a trial or face-to-face with some kind of discouragement or some kind of overwhelming circumstance and we've prayed to God or God has intervened in some way that there's no way that it could have happened by circumstance or by happenstance. There's no way that this was an accident. And then when the time comes, we're like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm really glad I was wise enough to navigate that situation. I'm really glad I, I was smart enough to like have some money in the savings account so that when that day of trouble came, like we were good, we were set. How, how quick are we to skip over God's involvement in our lives and to negate his hand? How often do we build up idols to ourselves when the point of it was that God is the one who's in control? How many times are we rocks skipping across a lake thinking that we know how to fly? Um, it's not a lesson that I have necessarily learned myself, but one that I am learning. And as we continue on in our journey, our study of this text together, I hope that we will see that God, most high, dwells among flesh. What, 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 What do you mean by that? If you'll remember... The first time the king, old Neb, went to his wise guys and said, hey, I need you to tell me not only the interpretation, but also the dream. They said, nobody could possibly do this. The only thing that, the only being, the only entities who could do this for you are the gods, and their dwelling is not with flesh. They don't live with us. They're not bothered with our business. But as we look at Daniel chapter 3, we'll see that they were wrong, that the most high God dwells among flesh. And that should be a great comfort to us. Would you continue reading with me in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 8? Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward to maliciously accuse the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? (laughs) Now, Now, if you were ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that you have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So, 
The king has set up this golden statue, and he said, look, when the music plays, I need you all to kneel down, to lift your hands, to worship at this thing. And they're like, everybody's on board. Everybody's playing the game. Like, all right, we got to stroke the king's ego here. This is kind of weird, but here we go. And so they worship this image. They worship this golden statue. But some notice, like, they're not praying with their eyes closed. Like, they're in church, but, and they got their head bowed, but they're, like, looking in the peripheral to see everybody else praying. Like, am I the only one? And they notice that these three guys aren't doing it. There's Jews. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they're, they're using their Babylonian names. They're not Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're not worshiping. So the king, remember, the king, he's got a hard nose. When, when it came time and people started pushing back, like, king, I think you're being a little bit ridiculous. We, can't, we cannot do the thing you're asking us to do in chapter 2. He said, look, the word for me is firm. I'm not going to change it. And then they come back and say, look, you said that immediately these guys got to be thrown into the fire. And so he calls them in and says, hey, is this true? Like, I know I said immediately, but I'm giving you an opportunity to get out of here. All you have to, like, when the music plays, you just got to do it, and we're, we're good. We'll let bygones be got bygones. My word is not firm here, which makes me wonder how much of a relationship he might have had with these guys. I'm not sure. That's reading in between the, te- in between the lines of the text. But there's something where he says, hey, guys, I'll give you a shot. Come on. Just, just get in line. But God is not held captive even when his people have failed. He's still working among these guys. <clears throat> I'd like for you to notice something. The charge, the, the charges brought against these three young men are there in chapter 3 and verse 12. They have, they have offended three parties. They have three, offense, three components to their charge. These, these men, they do not pay any attention to you, old Neb. They're not paying attention to you. They don't worship your gods. And they're not worshiping your statue. And their response is very, very precise. He says, in verse, in verse 18, is their plea. They say, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image. They're not saying, I'm not doing this to be disrespectful to you. We've been accused of being out here trying to cause disrespect to you, but I'm not trying to disrespect you. I'm just not going to participate in this, this, this litmus test that you have set up. It's not out of disrespect. It's because I cannot serve you rather than my God. They're even, they're even more precise. They say, uh, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He is able, and he will deliver us from your hand, right? So he's, gonna del- he's able to deliver us from the furnace. He can do that. But if he doesn't deliver us from the furnace, he will deliver us from your hand, because either way, we're getting out of this. If we go home to be with him, game, set, match. It is better to live or it's better to die and be with Christ, right? And if we survive the furnace, well, then we've definitely been delivered out of your hand. Who is the God who can deliver you out of my hand? They say, it's Yahweh. They stand with clarity when they know that they're being misunderstood. They're precise in how they respond. They address the concerns they are they're up front about what they are not going to do, and they know how it is being heard. They know that it is being heard as something that is disrespectful to old Neb, and he's going to take this personally. He, he already has. But they still stand and speak clearly about what's going to happen. Will we stand with clarity when we know that we're being misunderstood? If we have the promise from the lips of Jesus that in this world you will have trouble, will we stand with clarity when we know we're being misunderstood? And they say, God is able. God can do this. We have faith that God can. 
They have faith, but they also have humility. But if not, he's going to deliver us out of your hand. If you kill us, that's the last thing you can do to us. And here's um, an attitude that I see in some corners of the church today that makes me nervous because uh, there's this attitude that if you have a genuine faith, if your faith is serious, then you can walk in boldly into the throne room of God and lay down your commands and just expect the God of the universe to give you everything that you want. And I understand the boldness of the confidence of the relationship that we have with Jesus, like the reconciliation we have with God is legit. His love for us is beyond our comprehension. I, I do not dispute that. But you see here that confident and genuine faith is also not presumptuous. I have faith that God is able to rescue me from this fire. I'll even ask him to do it. But I trust that the decision is in his hand. He gets to call the shots here. And so if we're not delivered from the furnace... I still will continue to trust him in his hand. If he doesn't answer my prayers the way that I want him to answer my prayers, I will continue to give him honor. I'll continue to trust him. Confident and genuine faith is not presumptuous. There's another story from the life of Jesus that I think highlights this. Jesus heals a, man, uh, heals a, a man's son who is possessed by a demon. <laughs> Uh, or he's going to, he's getting ready to. And he says, look, like, if you had faith, Jesus says to the guy, if you had faith, I could do this. And the guy looks at Jesus and says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> like, I'm there. I'm, I'm with you. I believe that you can, but I'm not sure that you will. And I'm not trying to be presumptuous. I'm trying to be genuine with you. I want to be real. I want to be confident in your love that you care about what happens to me and what happens to my son, what happens to my family. I want to trust that you see my situation. I have the faith, but I also have the humility, and I understand, like, I'm yours to do with what you will. I'm a vessel in your hands. Do with me what you will. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because the Most High God dwells among flesh. Let's continue reading in verse 19. Daniel 3, 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and his expression and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, it's tr true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Oops. The most high God dwells among flesh. I did all that I could. I, I sent these men bound into the fire. I... I Heated up the fire as hot as it could possibly go. The heated up seven times is probably, uh, 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 um, not a euphemism, um, is probably a hyperbole. He's stating it as, as big as he possibly can. It's like, um, if you ever hear like rock and roll dudes, rock and roll dudes are like, yeah, man, it was cranked to 11, right? It's hyperbole because if you look at almost any guitar amp, the, the, the little knobs on there, they only go up to 10. So if it was cranked to 11, it's as cranked as it could possibly be, right? He says, heat up, like crank that furnace to 11. 
Heat it up seven times hotter than it can possibly be. And because it was urgent, and because it was so daggum hot, the guards, the army, the strong men, the, the marines of his army who bound him and carried these men up into the furnace, they died on the way. He killed his own men. He was not able to protect those in his care, but those in the care of God Most High, those in the care of Yahweh, fall into the furnace and just drop the ropes. And God walks around among them. We read together from Hebrews chapter 2. There was four men in the fire. And in Hebrews chapter 2, we see that God himself takes on flesh in Christ Jesus and it's, it's reading the New Testament back into the Old Testament to say that it is Jesus with them in the fire. But my confidence in Jesus makes me see him there. Uh, if, if, if we were with some Jewish brothers and sisters, I probably would not make that case so strongly um, because it's not in the text right here per se. But he's there in this moment. And Nebuchadnezzar is astonished. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. I'm burning his eyebrows off. He declared, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abagneo came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over, their body, over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's commands and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way than the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So the king comes and he calls them out. He says, guys, come out. And they walk out of the burning, fiery furnace. They don't smell like smoke. Their clothes aren't burned. And they're not even sweating I added that in there, but you, you, there's a contrast, right? There's a contrast between the servants of God walking out of the fire and the military might that tried to walk them in there and died on the way. And Nebuchadnezzar says, blessed be the God most high. I've used that term a couple of times because he uses it here, and it's important. <laughs> there's, there's a dynamic that's happening in this book uh, that can sometimes be difficult to, to unravel. Um, if we're familiar with the stories, we think, okay, that this, this is just part of the Bible and it's just part of like um, churchy language, right? And we are able, because of our distance from the text, to distance ourselves from the fact that these people were in exile. They were in a foreign land. They were not in the land that God had promised to give them. They were in a foreign culture that was hostile towards them and who did not want them to worship their God. And so as you go through the book of Daniel, the name Yahweh does not occur. There's always some other name for God. It's either just God, or it's Lord of Lords, or it's the God of Heaven is used repeatedly, but here is God Most High. And the other time that the word, the phrase God Most High shows up outside of Daniel is actually in Genesis chapter 14 with Melchizedek. And this is, this, is, all right, this is a deep cut. If you're not with me, then just give me a minute. I'll come back to the story. But Melchizedek is a guy who was living in Jerusalem before it was Jerusalem. Before it was in the promised land, Melchizedek was there. And he was the king of Jerusalem before God had taken over that and made that his holy city. And Melchizedek is a guy who's described as the king of peace. 
and Abraham, who was the guy who inherited the promise of God, who received the promises of God, paid tribute to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is called a servant of the Most High God. Most High God, the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar says here. I just need you to see, like the, 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 all of that discourse is to say this. These two portions where this title gets used are places that are outside of the promised land. The Most High God is a title that God uses for himself when he is out among the nations. in a polytheistic culture. When, when Yahweh is just one of the gods on the menu of gods that you could choose to serve this weekend, we don't call them Baal. We don't call them Bel. We don't call them Baal. We call them Boat. And we call them Television. And we call them Couch. When Yahweh is just one of the gods that you can choose to serve on the weekend, God calls himself the Lord Most High. If you want to look at me in a polytheistic context, then you need to know that I surpass everything else that is on the table. I am God Most High. And here, Nebuchadnezzar almost gets it. He almost gets it. He says, praise be to this God who is able to deliver his servants in this way. If I wasn't standing here, I wouldn't believe it. If I hadn't lost my eyebrows where they walked out unsinged, I would not believe it. But anybody who says anything against that God, he's going to be punished. Neb, come on now. He, he sees this happen. He says, okay, I can't. I don't have a category for this. My gods don't dwell among flesh. This, this is something different. Um, but I got another festival coming up next week, and I'm supposed to be the head of the parade, and uh, they're going to sacrifice things to me, and I got to eat, you know. So, there's, there's a lot. Of, I, I don't have a category for what just happened. All right, um, okay, so obviously this God is powerful, so anybody who says anything against him, yeah, yeah, that'll be, like, we can't talk bad about this guy. We want to be on his good side, so let's, let's, let's do it. And old Neb skips again. He's this close. For me, for a long time, I skipped. And I would say, well, I believe that there is a God, but I don't know that I necessarily can know anything about him or that he expects anything from me. I would see his power, and I would see the glory of his creation. And I would say, obviously, something made all of this, but, like, I can't, I can't call him Jesus. The most high God dwells among flesh, walks with his children in the fire and delivers them. And they stand with clarity even when they're misunderstood. Even when there's undisputable evidence of the power of God on display. And people still turn their hearts against him or turn their hearts away from him or refuse to yield their whole selves to him. We are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They are saying we are living sacrifices. We are presenting our bodies to God as living sacrifices. And he's honored that and he's preserved us for his name's sake. We, we just celebrated... Uh, communion together last weekend, and I'm reminded not only of the cup, the blood of Christ, which we sing about quite regularly, but also Jesus left us two parts of that sign, the cup and the bread. He gave up his body. He yielded his body as a sacrifice. And, and, and old Neb even honors these guys for how they were willing to give up their bodies, and yet he still stops short. He still says, anybody who says anything bad against that God, like, that's, that's a problem. But I'm not willing to yield myself to him. I'm still going to hold back. 
This is more than just a healthy respect for a higher power. Do we walk with the Most High God? This is more than not saying bad things about him <laughs> or, or not like using his name in a curse word. This is walking with the Most High God who dwells among flesh, who has been revealed with perfect clarity through his son, Jesus Christ. Do we look to him and do we walk with him? Would you pray with me? God, we are are so quick to skip. To see it, to come face to face, to come nose to nose with your power, your might, with your love and your grace, and just to skip it. To give you lip service, to say, like, you must be awesome, but like, you're not awesome enough to give my whole heart to, to build my identity on. I still, got, I still got things to do. I got people that are going to think weird about me if I commit myself to you. I can't, I can't lose that cred. God, would you break our hearts? Would you help us to see that you are enough? Would you help us to look at what you've done, that you have been here with us all along? in every fire and in every flood. God, would you help us to know that you are enough, that you are near to us, transcendent and glorious and almighty and yet near, imminent, close, loving. And would you help us by the power of your spirit to walk together with you, the Lord Most High, for your name's sake and for your glory in this world. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.